Thanks. And actually, the questions I was asked were mainly about the 80s. So um, as I look around the room, I see James Purnell in front row, who's first in the 80s uh, in a pram, helped deliver leaflets for me on the count. In the 70s, there we are, God, okay. And then I see lots of people with whom I worked with in the 80s. That, I, I made you younger, James. But, uh, <laughs> and that, uh, lots of people I worked with in the uh, uh, 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, and I know that one tends to, as a politician, look at the past through rose-tinted spectacles, but you all look incredibly young today. <laughs> um, I, I think we're thinking about 97, because what, can it give, what lessons can it give us to us today? Uh, and I, I think before, as we do that, you, we do have to think about the key differences, you know, the rise of identity politics, the cultural issues, and the great, it's much, much more difficult to triangulate between different interest groups than it was when we were developing the new labor agenda in the 90s uh, and 70s. And the other thing to think about is uh, the electorate is is much more volatile today and, uh, uh, than it was, again, when we built on traditional uh, loyalties in the 90s up, up until the 1997. And the other thing I would say is I've never thought short campaigns ever achieved that much. Uh, and certainly my experience, a bit different in fighting the BNP, was that if we hadn't campaigned for four years, we might have ended up with a first BNP uh, MP and controlled council in 19. Uh, 94, uh, sorry, 19, 2010, I'm getting my years, 2010. I, I then want to talk a bit, bit about the 80s, about the emergence of the extreme left in the Labour Party that came as the legacy of the Wilson and the Callaghan era. Because as part, I was, you know, we were all young in those days. Party members, especially the young, we did feel disillusioned with the uh, Labour government of the Wilson, the Wilson Callaghan Labour government. Public expenditure cuts that came in the wake of uh, the IMF intervention and the winter of discontent. And it was that disillusion and discontent and the exasperation and resentment that drew us young people into an unholy alliance between the soft left and the hard left that the hard left then exploited. And that's not unlike 2015. I think it was a similar phenomenon, uh, although uh, the hard left is, was more fragmented in the 80s than it was, uh, uh, I think, in, in, in 2015. Uh, their agenda in the 80s of sort of impossibilist demands, which they hoped would lead to some sort of revolutionary uprising among the working classes, moved in the 80s from the fringes to the mainstream. And that's a similar phenomenon that we experienced in 2015. Much of it in those days was led from local government, which I think is why you've asked me to contribute. You think of Ken Livingston, you think of Ted Knight, you think of Middleton up in Liverpool under Derek Hatton. Uh, and these extremists in local government made common cause with the extremists in the trade union movement, because of course that was the time of the miners' strike as well. Labour was in power in local government. So what we did in the 80s and how we behaved really mattered. And that's why it was such a disaster. So nothing, sorting out labor in local government was really also very important as part of the modernization uh, uh, movement that uh, was led, as, as, as uh, uh, John, John said, from Neil Killing onward. It was vital to creating a political party capable of winning. And I think Kinnock was the first one to understand that. I will never forget his 1985 speech, which I'm sure resonates with a lot of people here today, uh, on Liverpool when he cast, uh, castigated the militant for sending taxis round Liverpool with uh, redundancy notice as, 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 a, as a, a symbol of what ultra-leftism meant in local government. And we then had the disastrous, Caroline talked about the 83 election, I think of the 86 when we lost Greenwich, and 80, which was a very, very safe Labour seat, and 87 when we were absolutely trounced in what was, uh, you know, the third general election after a Labour defeat. The Tories got 42%, over 42% of the vote, and we got well under 30%, we got 27.6%, and the Tories got, it was a different era, it was a two-party era, more than no SNP around then, but the Tories secured 376 uh, seats, and it's just uh, sobering to think that was 87, it took us to 97 to win a general um, elections. Um, Kinnock's speech at the, uh, 
85 uh, Labour Party conference, I think, marked the moment when the soft left and the hard left separated, in my view, from in the Labour Party. We got the uh, expulsion of militant, although we didn't expel in the 80s uh, the thousands that we're, thank God, expelling the today. Uh, and the soft left started to set the agenda. I so remember the 87 election, because before that, uh, John McDonnell, working with Ken Livingston, had uh, really, after 83, set, set, set a program which said we weren't left enough. And it became very difficult. We had to respond to that imperative rather than actually create our, our, our own, uh, our own uh, values and importance. In 87, we got out of the st stable door first. We set the agenda. We said that in local government, you've just got to stop resolutionizing from the town hall steps in the ridiculous thing about uh, nuclear-free zones. Um, I remember in Islington, we uh, banned fox hunting off the A1. Very, uh, <laughs> a very successful policy. Um, uh, and we had to start focusing on delivery. So uh, we, uh, which meant that we had to answer the telephone and we had to make sure the bins were collected. So that I think was an absolutely, I think John will remember that, was a key, key moment. And then the hard left had to respond to that and we were able then to start turning things around. We organized like there was no tomorrow. There wasn't social media in their day, but I had endless telephone trees in my office, uh, not just at uh, ward level, making sure that, in fact, Tony Blair was an uh, Islington Party member then, and I remember ring him and Cherie, they were brilliant. You just say, you've just got to come out to this war, to this uh, meeting, your war, your vote matters, and they would always, always show up. Um, but we organized uh, at ward level, we organized across London, and John and I worked very closely together, and th through actually sheer strength of organization, we started to beat them. So you can't uh, ever diminish that. And we recruited at grassroots people who began, who wanted to see an alternative the, um, uh, uh, to, the, to the conservative government. We also changed the focus of what we did and what we said. Uh, we stopped talking about the dogma and the obsessions of the extremist, and we started just re responding to the priorities of people. And then I think came a better and more exciting period, which is answering some of the questions that were put to me. I think we started to demonstrate in local government that what we could do at the local level, and that was where Labour was in government, uh, could set the a pattern, or could, could set an example of what Labour might achieve at national level. And I certainly remember, in, in, in our case, Sure Start was something that we embarked on in Islington when the ILEA was abolished and we suddenly got the uh, uh, nursery schools and we found that we could combine them with council nurseries and start building services around the needs of children with a child at the center of what we did and giving them the best start in life. That was brilliant. Welfare to work initiatives, new deal for communities. There were all sorts of ideas uh, and, uh, that, that we thought of then. And as I look at the local authority leaders, certainly in London, where I know it best, that have emerged from last night, I think there is, again, a lot of talent there that hopefully can start demonstrating the difference the Labour government can do. Also, there were figures in local government who emerged as leaders on the national stage, and I think particularly of David Blunkett, who was probably the most uh, effective of that. And from being a distraction to Labour, which is what we were in the early 80s, I think... Uh, we showed that uh, you know, how to build support for new labor, and we started to demonstrate the difference labor uh, could be. Uh, it isn't that we became the most important exemplar of best practice, but we allowed, it, by changing who we were, what we said, and what we did, we allowed Nash, the National Labour Party and the national leadership to become the story, rather than us being the story. The 1997 landslide came from the efforts of the whole of the new Labour family and the whole of the new Labour movement. And again, if you look at the analogies with the today, the Tories were losing it, the exit from the ERM, uh, and also the sleaze in the Tory party at that time were very similar to the cost of living crisis and party gate. But, and this is uh, the controversial sort of argument that was going on in the early 90s, there was a move that John Smith represented, who was a brilliant man, but he represented a view that one more heave would get us into power. And there was a new Labour uh, led by 
both Gordon and Tony, which said we had to continue to, uh, to modernize and change. And the, that was why Clause 4 was so important, moving from uh, a, an obsession with nationalization to one which talked about the many, not the few, as being the objective of, of value which underpinned the Labour Party was hugely important. And I do think that if we hadn't had that change of leadership, we would never have won three terms uh, in government, we may have won one, whatever you, what argument about how we used it. So I think as we look forward, what Tony did and what Gordon did working together in the run up to 1997 was the clause four, followed by a strong vision and a simple message. And that's where Labour's got to get together. Many, not the few. And I think really important, seeing economic prosperity and social justice as not competing objectives, but interlinked ambitions. And that was a value that I took in with me in every ministerial job I held. Uh, and I think underpinned a lot of the work we did when we were in government. And a simple pledge with five simple promises on it. Three of them were probably wrong. You won't, you, you know, you won't actually raise standards by simply do, uh, reducing class sizes. You won't necessarily provide a better health service by reducing waiting lists. And you certainly should have talked a bit more about tax if we wanted to spend uh, 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 in the in in the interests of the many, not the few. But nevertheless, it was simple. It was direct. It was positive, it was forward looking, and it was hugely, hugely important with a whole lot of very, very simple messages of education, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, rights and responsibilities, uh, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, we can go on and on. So, and we were disciplined, John, we were disciplined in the run up to 97. And I think that was hugely important. But the most important thing about 97, which is beginning finally to emerge in the labor in the labor family today is we wanted to win